a once through economy, if you're in your little village and you chop a tree down or you catch a fish and you consume it and then you create culture and art and music and life and more people and then you throw the waste out on the edge of the village, it doesn't particularly matter if you're a certain scale. Right? You can get away with that for a long period of time. But if you're doing this coin doubling thing, if you're just stacking up and stacking up, eventually you end up where we are. You end up with a world that's basically full. And what if you had multiple mathematicians playing the same game on the little planet, all trying to stack up as fast as possible, guys getting left behind, things get militarised, you end up going to war, chasing the next stack of coins. It's the world that we're in. If you really break it down and be brutally simple about it, anything playing that game is going to face either a depletion trap or a pollution trap. We got lucky, we've hit both at the same time. <laughs> Isn't it interesting to be in 2013? That the biggest depletion trap that we're facing at the moment, things like freshwater fish, oil, and the pollution trap, obviously, climate change is the big one, but if we had all night, we could probably list a lot, so we won't. So that is one particular rule set. Here's a, here's a different one. Here's a rule set that is a lot older. It's a little more complicated, but not that much more. You can play the coin doubling game, which basically just says over what period are you stacking up the next set of coins, or we could start to behave like the rest of the biosphere and close these loops. So the jargon is a closed loop economy where you're borrowing the best ideas from creatures that figured it out three and a half, four billion years ago. It's the basic organising principle of the biosphere. Any species that doesn't behave like that simple, oversimplified crude diagram expresses, anything that didn't behave like that is long gone into the fossil record. So these, this is actually quite a, quite a trustworthy set of rules when you think about it. And every part of that renewable or that closed loop economy exists. If you think about it, um, every part of what we need exists today. Renewable inputs, that's the big one really, I'm gonna spend a reasonable amount of time on that tonight. Solar power stations a mile across that just harvest the sun, bioplastics, sustainably grown and managed plantations on the other side, you know, industrial scale composting, wetland filtering, water sensitive urban design, recreating a city as it's growing, as it's alive, not in a computer graphic, but in the world, so that it actually pays basic respect to the biosphere that it's a part of. Every piece of that already exists. So both economies actually are existing side by side. But we know, and you know, or you probably wouldn't have bothered to come tonight, that one of them is uh, doing significant amounts of damage and has a lot more momentum behind it. So we've got to find a way back to these older rules. This is how we won't do it. Can we not go here. A guy called Garrett Hardin in 1974 published a, a work called Lifeboat Ethics. I don't know whether, whether you come across this or not, but it's the ethic that says the wealthy basically just going to need to surround the lifeboat with barbed wire. I'm paraphrasing some. He didn't actually say it like that at all. Um, but it's the idea that if the world is full and there are people in the water and we're in the lifeboat, we're probably going to need to fend people off. And it is kind of the opposite conclusion that I drew uh, when I came across these ideas, that we are not going to get away with militarised first world fortresses with solar panels on them and machine guns repelling people trying to get here from across the ocean from less fortunate parts of the world. Does this sound familiar? Does it sound like we... Yeah, cue nervous laughter. <laughs> Does it sound like we might already have one foot in that world? It's actually scary, and you will see that kind of greenwashing of, well, what if we just secede? Particularly handy being on an island, isn't it? Uh, surround the place with razor wire and stop all of the boats, and we'll be all right. And the fact is, I think, given the magnitude of what we're facing, we'll all end up going down together. You know, you win the privilege of being the last one to starve. Woo. So let's, really, let's not do that. Um, this has to be about people. Everything that we've released during this election campaign, everything that the Greens have been working on since we got Joe Valentine elected in 1984 has been about people. It's been about social equality and social justice, and there are very good reasons for that. Uh, the work that Rachel, my colleague, Senator Rachel Seawitt's done on aged care, uh, on single parents' pension, is based on 
tilting the table back because we will all sink or swim together here in Australia and also globally. So all of the policies that, we, that we've been running, the campaigns that we've been running with some successes, some pretty hard work, still pushing things uphill, that's what that's about, people and social justice. Who's come across this? The spirit level. I can't even see you if you raise your hand, so don't <laughs> worry. Okay, a couple. This is a really beautiful book if you like statistics, but if you actually, if you like people. Uh, the premise of this book says that disparities in wealth between wealthy countries, they're mainly studying the OECD, um, matter much less in terms of things like childhood mortality, obesity, mental health, rates of crime. Differences in income between countries actually don't matter. There's no real correlation. Differences of income within countries, however, are vastly important, are tremendously important. The less equal your society, the more obese your children, the worse mental health, your more violent society. Education, kids dropping out of school earlier. It's a profound understanding and that's why everything that we really do in the Greens is about caring for people. It's about making sure that the people who are getting left behind in the here and now, in the dirty backwash of the mining boom, don't get left any further behind and in fact make it into the lifeboat. So it's people-centred, closed-loop economics that we're playing with. Let's keep that model in our minds as we go. Because what would that actually look like if you jump, I'm a former graphic designer, so I apologise for how fussy um, all this design work is, but what happened if you tried to roll these principles and these ideas across a city of two million people? You know, we know how to do sustainability at the level of a house, and it's been applied very successfully at the level of a village. But right now, on this planet, at this time, people are figuring out how to do it at the scale of very large industrial cities and in fact whole countries. That closed loop economy, call it what you will, is actually taking form all over the place. But what would it look like? So we started with Perth. We figure, let's just start with the home ground. What would happen if we just got our own house in order? And it's a fairly deep current in urban planning and urban theory, this idea of, of urban metabolism. You know, we're saying we need to borrow some of that older rule set from the rest of the biosphere. Well, cities are part of the biosphere. You know, we didn't arrive here from space. We're built of the same fabric as the rest of the planet. We've been here all along. The chemistry of your, of your blood is the same as the chemistry of seawater because that's where we came from and our technology came from there as well. Didn't come from, didn't come from some alien dimension. The, the things that we drive around in, the weapons that we use to make war on each other are all from the biosphere. So the idea of metabolic cities where you imagine, as we were just thinking before about the village and scale that up to scales vastly large, you remember that stack of shipping containers on the dock. Um, one of the things that we announced today was an upgrade to the Fremantle rail bridge so that we can get some of the container traffic off roads. It's not as expensive as you might think. But we don't get to design the city from scratch. It's been here for nearly 200 years. We've got to work with what we have. So using state planning documents and using history, using existing neighbourhoods and urban villages and the existing heavy rail network, which is one of the best, um, best in the country, actually, but you notice how very metro-centric it is. And that's partly because uh, all the high-value jobs are there. And wealthy people in cities are very good at capturing further wealth for themselves. Um, only, it's less than 20% of the jobs in this town are in the central business district. But look where the public transport goes. You live in Malaga or Welshpool or you work out there, you're probably going to have to drive because the buses only come about every three weeks. So <laughs> we've proposed a second tier, middle tier public transport system that is not all metro focused, that allows you to get from everywhere to everywhere. The reason that we're doing this, I guess, if you haven't already figured it out, hopefully becomes clear before we're done. So the Perth Light Rail project, we're part way through winning this one, that's kind of good, uh, would introduce that middle tier and start to lace together so that you can start to compete with the private car and get from anywhere to anywhere. So that's stage one, on, what, stage one and two, and fill in the rest, at least in the short term, with the rapid bus. You don't have to bother with a timetable, you turn up, the next one's no more than eight or nine minutes away, you're dry, Maybe there's free Wi-Fi and you can get a cup of coffee uh, and you're not going to be waiting there for hours and hours. Then people will transfer. And that's one way of making an anywhere-to-anywhere anywhere public transport network. 
you fill in the freight and you can start to see the city, the whole metro area, not just the inner wealthy bits, but the whole city um, in rather more an organic way and start to think about how it could be obeying some of those underlying rules that will help it to survive. Now, that's really where the Perth 2.0 project came from. Reboot, really, let's stop playing the coin doubling game before someone gets seriously hurt. So what we did, we've worked with some uh, unusual and extremely inspiring partners along the way. There's a project that we developed called Transforming Perth, which said if you were gonna really go for it and create a transit-oriented city, a really livable one where a lot of your population lived very close to public transport and didn't need a car, although yes, we start talking about infrastructure, remember actually we're really talking about people, how would the place end up? So we used these seven representative corridors in a study with the Property Council, who represent the development industry, and ORDRAC, which is a wonderful little research, little urban research and design centre in Perth, as kind of neutral ground, while the greenies and the developers eyed each other off from the corner of the room and gradually <coughs> met in the middle, and conducted this yield study called Transforming Perth, that said if you took these corridors, these representative corridors, there's seven, out of the 18 uh, corridors metro-wide that the, the uh, state governments identified, and you preserved everything that is valuable. You preserve all the heritage places, you preserve all the green space, the urban bushland, the footy ovals, the churches. Uh, you take that off the table, you take 50% of strata titles off the table. And then you, you start to go up, not Hong Kong up, but three or four stories. Perth, we have to get over our fear of heights. <laughs> we re okay, is three stories all right? Can we deal with three just along public transport corridors in places where it's appropriate? So you're not looking at ploughing through heritage neighbourhoods or places that are basically good. You're talking about the big box stores, the petrol stations, the car yards, the vacant weedy lots and the tilt up crap that no one would miss. Maybe heritage list one of them is <laughs> just as a warning to generations to come. <laughs> Um, the question was across three different density scenarios and the highest up we went was eight storeys. How many more people could you fit along those seven corridors? And the answer that came back, depending on the, the scenario you choose, is between 94,000 and a quarter of a million dwellings. Now remember, that's just in the seven corridors. That's, that's not all of them. And we, that kind of set us back on our heels a little bit. It's like the city doesn't need to sprawl anymore. It really doesn't need to. Uh, at the same time as we're creating a transit-oriented city, we can also be taking the pressure off the urban fringe. More on that in a moment. So we come back to this idea of a transit city. It's what we used to be. You look at the suburbs that were laid out, Fremantle, east of Fremantle, suburbs immediately north and around Perth, in the 1890s and early 20th century were transit cities. They were laced together by tram lines. And they still have that character. One used to run right round this university campus. You can still tell if you're up the corner of Beaufort and Walcott Street, Mount Lawley, you can just about hear the ringing of the bell. It still has that character, so we can bring that back. That was where the Perth Light Rail proposal came from. That was something that we kicked off on Butcher's paper about 10 days out from the 2007 federal election. We just kind of made shit up. We, uh, <laughs> um, with a picture of the existing bus network with a, with a reasonable idea of the frequency and where the existing public transport spine was, um, created this map, did a rough costing, launched it. It was one of the few things during the campaign that got a bit of pickup, and people really like it because you can get a grip on how it would look, how it would change the character of a neighbourhood. But remember, we start with infrastructure. Actually, all along, we're talking about people. Here's what happened earlier this year in the May budget. Half a billion dollars was announced by the Labor government for rail projects in Perth. <laughs> Wasn't sure if you were still with me. Um, <laughs> here's what happened just not that long ago. Um, I think that's the only time his face is in this presentation from, um, like just really, oh. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, really, one of the strangest announcements I've ever seen. We won't fund urban rail. Roads are good for health. Roads are good for the environment. Roads are good for mental health. Roads are sustainable. Roads are sustainable. Um, you think I'm joking and you're laughing a little bit and actually these things have all been said. 
uh, by the chap who might be Prime Minister in nine days' time, uh, that there will be no public transport under a government I lead. It's bizarre. It's avoidable. That's why we're here, because it's avoidable. Bizarre nonetheless, we will prevail.